Welcome back. This is the podcast Truth and Illusion with your host, Christian Fan Lee and Katie Curioso. So welcome to the pre-read for episode three. So the pre-read is really just Miss Katie Curioso and I's way of riffing on the topic to figure out uh, what we want to talk about. And it allows us to talk more philosophically about these topics. And we discuss things like metaphysics and ontology. And in this episode, we talk a lot about impermanence and the various uh, descriptions and ways it shows up in our world. After this pre-read, next Monday, we will have our live show, which will last about an hour and 15 minutes. And there it will be much more practical and focused on sharing stories and uh, grounded in experience. So for this pre-read, be prepared to go in uh, wherever the conversation goes. And if you take this journey with us, there's really no promises um, that in the end uh, that it makes any sense at all. So bear with us. So we keep hitting at the idea that reality is not what it seems, right? And we keep having little forays and forays into perception, into kind of like how we see the world. And I think the upside down world is, is um, yeah, the idea that um, how reality is given to us, you know, um, is, a, is a kind of like the Anil Seth, the uh, neuroscientist, said it's a conditioned hallucination. And um, uh, as, as far as the brain is concerned, we have a predictive machine. That is, it's the reason why my friend got a haircut and uh, I was uh, doing a, a call with her today and uh, my brain kept projecting. I could see her, like because the background was kind of black and her hair is black, but she has a full haircut. She doesn't have much hair. I kept seeing long hair where there wasn't. And uh, just because of your brain's trying to fill in, right? So I think it's interesting to go into that just from a, okay, so reality isn't what it seems from the, there's a, and then there's a really nice, I think, yoga chara point of view that is like a phenomenal point of view, which I think you'd like to um, critique and also just like be fascinated by it. But if we give a phenomenological account of how we perceive reality. And then the big question is, how does that affect, um, you know, the way we show up in the world, given that we think um, the two wives is a, is like a more practical example of um, that. So it could be that. And then the other part of the upside down world is the, um, I thought of it last time, which was like, um, how we began to optimize as a society um, for the accidentally, not accidentally, but um, there's a quote by um, Kodo, homeless Kodo, which says something like, it's very easy to um, manipulate people who are in the, who see the world uh, in the way that it appears to them. It's very easy to use them for capitalism, for all these things, very easy. Um, it's nearly impossible for someone that sees the illusion. Um, but it's not to, which I wanted to actually play with the tagline that you said, which is more truth, less illusion. Uh, because I also think part of what uh, Koda, Homeless Koda was also saying is you have to find a way to rest in illusion. Like the appearances are not going to like disappear for you, right? Being enlightened doesn't mean, you know, Katie doesn't show. It just, I just know Katie doesn't actually exist in the way that I see her. 
And that fundamental insight means that I'm not taking her as some essentialist. So yeah, there's, there's this, so it's, it's um, between essentialism and nihilism really is where the conversation is. Okay. It just makes me think too of, of moments in history, like Salem witch trials, mm. uh, which are really a land grab. They were really mm. a land grab orchestrated by fairly well off people who wanted more land. And so the easy way to, to get everyone to get rid of the elderly widows mm. Mm. who were, you know, who had the land they inherited from their husbands who, you know, those were the days people were dying and like, okay, the lady's still going. How do we right. get that land? And well, right. we can get that land if, if she's incarcerated or executed. Um, but it became, mm. A, a shared, del, it's shared delusion of the masses that we're not going to benefit from it. Right. They were not all going to get the land. They were. It was not like this is funny. We're going to persecute so and so because we'll get the land. Like they were. They were right. really convinced they were witches. Right. So um, that mass delusion, or like the same thing with the satanic panic of the eighties. Mm. Like heavy metal becomes popular. Pretty soon they're convinced that like the records are full of satanic messages if you play them backwards. And like good people were being jailed on suspicion of murder just because they happened to wear a Metallica t-shirt. Mm, you know, like it's right. crazy. It feels like it's hard to believe, but it had echoes of that. But what was to be gained? Who knows? But it was a once it took hold of parents' imagination that were uncomfortable with the music in the first place. Right. Uncomfortable with pentagrams, which were just mainly a symbol of rebellion against the Christian status quo of the states, you know, mm. it became they took it, at, they really believed it. So like there's, um, right. there's something in that um, shared hysteria. Right. And it doesn't have to be, that's a lot of persecution. It doesn't have to be persecution. Right. It can be other things that we don't even realize. Right. Judgments are made because the majority has right. convinced us that's the rule. Right. That's, and it doesn't those are really interesting points I want to noodle on those. Those are the ones I think we should bring up because I think those are really good examples um, of, like you said, the shared hysteria or shared hallucinations. And it reminds me of um, the, uh, like, it's a good example, but we can, and not but, yes, and we can go even further. Right, and it's to say that um, the contact we make with reality, usually I think we're making divisions between truth and falseness around like, um, we say like pain is real, suffering is fake. Right, like get shot, that's real. You know, physical, we made this, Cartesian thing right happened with the, the mind body duality and we made all these discriminations between what is real and fake and in that um, uh, Kodo homeless Kodo and his ghost story he says when you see a ghost as underpants, right? Um, you're like, oh that that's absurd, you know but he wants to take it a step further and he says, why did, oh, I need money. Why isn't that equally? So it's, so with the witch trials, it's like seeing them as witches is absurd to our co conventional, even normal people now see that, see the, some of those things that happen as absurd. Um, but they still have this delineation. We still have this delineation of like, seeing them as just regular people with personalities is not absurd. But I'm, I, I'm, I would argue that that's absurd to think of like Katie Gorman as a real um, thing that I'm in direct contact with. That's so, yeah, I think homeless Kodo put it in a much I mean, funny, funnier I know, way. I know I'm your hallucination, but I don't think you do. <laughs> right. Right. I like that. <laughs> I like that. The things that I have to say. So every time you yeah. say homeless photo, from the very start, I just pictured like a mother who's just given birth in a very nice modern hospital. Right. And she's holding baby homeless Kodo. And 
which is obviously this is not what how his life went. And someone comes in for with the birth certificate and says, Get first name, homeless. Be <laughs> <laughs> homeless. Be homeless. <laughs> You know, I don't think many people go by homeless, uh, even the yeah. homeless. Um, right. So I had to say that because it's been, I keep getting that mental picture and it keeps cropping. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, baby, homeless. Um, uh, yeah, sending the I birth note to all your friends. Like, did you really name her baby homeless? Like, it's, it's terrible. I think if you, if you saw a picture of her, you might think that that actually did happen. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, I remembered this is a this is more about a trick of the eye, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's a very surface level version of what, what you're talking about. It's underpants as a ghost. There was a in college on the way home from every show I ever went to. There, there's a there's an exit from the highway, and it kind of rolls around, and you come off of it pretty fast. You know, and you're kind of slowing because you know at the end of this curve, there's a stop sign, and every single time the placement of the street light. Mm -hmm. on the street and the placement of a sign in a tree mm -hmm. made this very distinct shadow. So the, the ramp itself, as you're driving, you're turning the corner and it's lit up very nicely. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's this weird nondescript darker area. Mm -hmm. Every single time I almost swerved, I thought it was a body. Wow. Like a person who had been hit, hit right. and run, wearing, you know, black clothing or like in a crumpled ball. It was flat. Right. You know, shadow. Right. But, something about the layering of the shadows of the the, the sign and the, and every single time i came off that thing it was a shock mm, right and i almost slam on the bridge which could have caused me to be the body in that part right. of the road. But it, was, right. it was so real to me and i was like i do this every time but it was this weird reflex right you think i would brace before but i thought if i get too used to it eventually it will be a body right, right. there and i'm right. going over a dead body right Right. Like, you know, it was just a weird, I just I hadn't thought of that yeah. in a year until you mentioned this. And I was like, oh, that was kind of my underwear on the line. Right. <laughs> right. It was so real to me. Mm. Or like if you're trying to navigate your room in the dark and you've had your furniture wherever it always is and you can do it pretty well. But if mm. you would just rearrange things, you're going to think you got to step around the, the end table and like, oh, like you bump into the couch because it's not where you thought you were. And it's, it's strange. Like you just right. preconceived notions. Right, right. You're you're kind of mapping, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've had a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, oh, I forgot I got down that box, and it's just like, oh, like right. it's so unexpected. Even though you put it there, and it's like, it's just because you have this built-in notion that you know the lay of the land. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I had another friend that would would prank other people when they weren't in the room. He would move their furniture just like half an inch. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what a ripple effect people will have. Like, I bet. Down, I can imagine like, oh, falling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just a That's tiny, so tiny good. That's so funny. And then they're like, I'll be right back. You know, you're watching a movie at their place. They're like, I'll be right back. And you're like, uh, and you just move. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You just sit there and just watch. I'm so like, glad that this person does that. <laughs> 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 That's so good. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I mean, it's so not, not a harmful thing, but it's, it just makes you realize like the person doesn't even realize like what's off about me right now. Like, why am I so right. discombobulated? And he's like, I know. <laughs> right. I know he's like why. falling into everything. Yeah. Right. Like it's not going to yeah. hurt anybody, but it's, it's interesting how you can mess with people's I, minds and people accepting things as being permanently one way. Yeah. And I think the, um, I, li I like how you put the the permanent one way part because part of this is like qualifying what we mean by a lot of things that people say. Some people say like it doesn't exist, and it's actually the, I don't think it's very clear what that means. Even though it, f it feels to me like I know what existence is, but actually in the non dual traditions, they mean something very specific, at least in the words that are set up. And existence, in this case, like when, when someone says empty, emptiness, this, this water bottle, which we talked about, we talked about the water bottle. Yes. Okay, is empty. And empty of what, right? The question of empty of what has to come up. 
and it's empty of an inter eternal existence. It doesn't have a, a, a soul in which it is a labeled water bottle or a function of a water bottle. And that is, I think, the problem I'm having is that I understand a lot of it, I think, experientially. I'm barely starting to form the kind of nomenclature or words that might be used to help describe that. But I am not sure how useful it is without these sort of metaphors and analogies that kind of point you in that direction of like, okay, so what does that mean for my relationship? And what does that mean for like the reason I suffer? Are we going to go back to impermanence? I don't think we're going back to impermanence. I think we're saying, so what doesn't exist is something eternal. So we can take, I think, really good examples, like you said. One example we could bring up is Hitler, right? It is a great form of eternalism. Inside of these people contains the essence of greatness and the essence of not greatness, right? Um, or, or I guess he yeah. would have said something way worse, I think. Well, also, I mean, like, Hitler is interesting. People don't want to think about any positive aspects of Hitler. And I mm -hmm. mean, why would you waste your time? Really? I mean, come on, mm. bad guy in general. But I don't know if it was just his PR campaign that he loved animals, mm. but legend has it that he was mm -hmm. quite, quite into like animal rights mm. and that he treated his dogs with an amazing amount of affection. Mm. You know, there's the raised by a single mother, rejected from art school, like a mm. lot of failure, like just the dorky kid who would go give speeches to rocks in the countryside. I did a report on Hitler when I was a kid. I was wow. very self-conscious because I had to go check out from the John Steinbeck Library, a million books about Hitler as a blonde Aryan youth. <laughs> it's for school. It's for school. And I'm like, you know, in fifth grade and these are like big tomes for adults. I'm like, it's school, I promise. Wow. Kids Interesting. Like, I can read these. Like, they're not that hard. Like, I just. And you were aware of that back then. You were aware okay. of. Like, you thought of yourself. Blonde, like, blue-eyed, white girl checking out every book you have on Hitler. I just felt like, how do I do this? Interesting. It was awful. But let's but, talk about that too. I, 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 I'm very interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of horrifying, uh, but I learned a lot. At least I learned a lot of what. It's hard to know what is true and what isn't. And what's hyperbolic and what it was his PR machine and what you know like propaganda it's hard to know what's true about him but he seemed like a real loser could not like his art was just mediocre everything about him was mediocre or worse mm. and so if you were his teacher in grade school and you see like this this greasy little kid has no friends he's not very attractive he's pretty bossy mm -hmm. he acts really weird he kind of goes and he lectures rocks for fun like because no one will listen to him like you might think Poor little Hitler, if he only had a chance. <laughs> you know? right, right. Like, and if you died before he became the monster that everyone knows he is, that person's experience of Hitler would have been as this, you know, who knows? The right. little boy in his class that probably could have benefited from more love or whatever. Right, so like, right. his dogs think that he's the kindest master right. possible. So empty, like, empty Hitler. Empty Hitler. Yeah. If Hitler's empty. Right. He is absolutely empty and but hard to I, say. I still think we'll get in a debate because I get that empty is not your word. I get this is a translation of concepts just like. Sinyata, right. I get that it's a, a translation that I'd like to talk to these translators who did the first translations and be like, shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> Budin <laughs> said life is suffering. <laughs> he said it's to satisfaction. Like right. dissatisfaction can mean suffering, right. but it's a bit more muted. It can have a lot of forms, whereas suffering is like something you, <sighs> it's, yeah, it's a much more intense, distracting, it's like, it's not the right word. Like it mm. has a lot of interpretations. You pick the wrong word. So, right. these quotes, so I feel like emptiness to me, weirdly, is openness, mm. open to right. interpretation. That water bottle, right. Hitler, Hitler and the water bottle, Hitler holding the water bottle. Right. Right. It could be, it could be yeah. the he eccentric guy in town holding a vase. Right. It could right. be the you know the guy who did those paintings when he was younger, holding a rolling pin for bread because you could right. use it. Like it could be like you could see it a lot of ways. Unfortunately, he's 
Hitler and his awful, but, uh, but it's open to interpretation if you don't know that. Right. So the question that I would have for you then is, well, which is the right one? Isn't the answer that everything is that way, so that's, there is no right one? Mm. Mm. So... It's all? All of the above? Hmm. Or none? Is it none of the above? And that's what makes it empty. Yeah, that's a really good... So I, th I think it's really subtle, the way it's been explained to me in something called the Madhyamika Prasangika, which is... You know, a funny, funny, funny word. Very funny Akuna word, Matata yeah. to you as well, Christopher. Right. <laughs> one, of the, one of the philosophers that I think you would be very interested in, in reading, even if you just read his main um, text, his name is Nargajuna. And he is the one who wrote the, using, what is it called, logic ad absurdi absurdium arguments, basically, that uh, show the emptiness of, of movement, of identity, of all the, like he has a whole book on the identity, the, the lack of self-existence of everything. Um, and he went through and logically um, used logic to uh, refute all the standing arguments because there was a standing argument about there being a creator God during the time and he showed um, how there, how that couldn't be through logic. Um, and we can talk about that. He showed just, he showed how the Hindu idea of Brahman, which my first, uh, character in Chinese fun, uh, is a translation of, of that kind of creator God, but also the Brahman of like the all fulfilling one consciousness. And he completely, um, tore that apart in, in logic. And, um, he's seen as being, uh, kind of deconstructionist, but because he's also part of the religion, he has the he's inserting that salvational quality of um, we suffer because um, actually nothing um, because things are empty and we think they're not empty. And uh, uh, he didn't, of course, he used the Sanskrit word. He didn't use the word empty like he said. And um, I think maybe two interpretations of Hitler is, and I have to be really honest with myself about this, especially saying it on video, because I know it has, um, it's a touchy subject for a lot of people. And the fact is there are, um, are you still there? Are you still there, Katie? I'm back. Nice. Are we back in, in sync? Two, two healers and then... Uh, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's an algorithm that detected the word Hitler and... <laughs> Our banner and ads are going to be real weird when we hang up. Like we're going to go on, on, the, on the net and not every banner ad's like, Hitler! Mein Kampf! <laughs> <laughs> Hi today! Right. But before uh, these times, these troubled times. <laughs> Oof, yeah. I'm sorry, too too soon. Too yeah. soon. Yeah, I think um, Suzuki Roshi here said a quote such as, there's no such thing as um, enlightened people or bad people. There's only um, enlightened and bad activity. And all of that is uh, coming from uh, a mind, whoever is projecting that. So from my perspective... Um, there's no way to call Hitler a bad person and be absolutely um, certain about that because good. Do you want to put, I mean, like I get, I get where you're coming from and, but I'm just thinking of you in your current human form. Right. <laughs> I get from a philosophical point of view, we could pick someone who's a little less. Yeah. But, yeah, but I do want to note that it doesn't mean that the actions that he performed are um, good actions. Right. And I think um, from a consequentialist perspective, uh, valuing human lives, what he's done is absolutely abhorrent. I want to say that 
he is not an individual. So that is the real problem here. He's caused by various cause, causes and conditions that came together to create this thing that we are all calling Hitler. I'm not debating um, his um, justice or anything like that. I actually think um, the actions and as far as human life is concerned, those are abhorrent actions um, and had abhorrent results. Um, but to say that somehow this is like an individual coming out of, go ahead, go for it. Yeah. Teacher, teacher. Okay, so I think it might be a little bit of a lag. Oh no. That's okay. Testing. Yes, Testing. I hear you. Am I synced up? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to make it interesting. Um. Uh. <laughs> there you go. Rocking the other way. Um. If everything is empty, mm -hmm. how can his actions be abhorrent? Right. Right. Um. So well, I tried to qualify that with saying that if I say that human life is valuable and I take that as a, as a given, then I can say that the actions of going against human life are important. But at the, um, at the ultimate level, yeah, unfortunately, we will have to give in to the idea that that's coming from me. So it's okay to think that things are abhorrent and that his actions were abhorrent, given you also know that that's coming from you. That's not objectively true. Well, well, right, because he, he is the hero, or was the hero, and hopefully right. isn't here currently to too many, but he's, you know, some, it's scary to think, but he only rose to that because he was enabled by others, and he, I think it's also interesting that he put, he was also like, like your rock star who's like, if I just had another $30 million right. on top of the $30 million, he's thinking right. that I could only just kill another million Jews. Right. Like it's, it's obviously morally by my standards, because mm -hmm. if everything's empty, I'm the one who's giving it a quality right. judgment. Right. But like, I would much rather like, let the guy suffer who's like, you know what, I just want more money and I want more women and I want more cars. Right. That's more harmless to society at large. It's mainly his struggle and, and like the people in his life struggle versus like a nation, a world, you know, um, millions of, of innocent people being slaughtered. So like there is a difference there, but it's both, it's always about externalizing value. Right. Whether that's achieving more or killing more or accusing more witches, or, you know, like, it's the externalization of, like, if only this, then we will have what we need. And that you can always push it right. further. Right, and, and I think we have to say, what is, how does that start? And I think the, where Nargajuna starts is from eternalism. So how does that work? I, I want to know what you think about that statement, that Nargajuna think is starts from thinking about things in terms of eternalism or um, solidness or people having, the people I'm looking at having fixed attributes, not necessarily from starting with dissatisfaction, starting with these projections and then being dissatisfied with those project, those fixed identities. Like, oh, that person is mean. That person has the attribute of mean. I'm dissatisfied that this person exists in my life or something. He's saying that the basis is starting with eternalism. If you didn't have eternalism, he thinks you can't have dissatisfaction. I'm confused by what you mean by eternalism. I think I need you to define that because I'm thinking eternalism makes it sound like something, the belief that something will last forever. Is that what you mean by eternalism? It's like a substance view, like, um, there's something like, okay, let's, let's do like our own analysis. Like, okay, so there's these practices in, in, in many non-dual traditions and contemplative traditions where um, uh, St. John of the Christ was referred to as something nada, not, not, we don't have to go into that, but there's some nice Christian mysticism that, that also um, plays into here where you actually just look for yourself. 
and you do it really deeply and you can start, there's like, you can just do it on your own or you can take instructions. Part of the instructions is go try to find yourself in the body. Right. And we talked about this in meditation. Where am I? Am I behind my eyes? And you try yeah. to look for yourself. Right. Um, where is that self? And um, you try to find it in the body. You try to find it in the mind. You try to find it uh, in your money. You try to find it in your job. You try to find it everywhere. And, I'm in my eyes, by the way, unfortunately, still in my goddamn right. eyes. Right. And that's a pers- and that's so persistent. Right. Like, I'm thinking of the last time I had the experience of being outside of that. I was, oh, I was uh, talking to Francis about it. Um, I was, uh, I was crying because I was listening to this uh, um, Chinese. I was, my teacher assigned me these Chinese videos that are like, kind of like stories. And uh, this, then tears came out. I could to- I totally knew that they weren't my tears, that this body was and mine was in this state of crying. And it was, but then another part of me seemed to be, uh, after I understood that place, laughing. And I could see when I was laughing, I felt this like, I mean, when it, crying was happening, I felt like the tears coming out and so alien to them, right? And so I think those are like peak moments where you realize. Like, like when, oh, the ghost story that you told yesterday of going to a haunted house and getting, a, becoming afraid and then laughing. I think it's because that, that's a moment of like, who, who, who was so freaked out by that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I thought that thing was a real spider. Right. Like, right. Pipe cleaner. It's, right. Yeah. 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 And there's, there's, and the reason supposedly the Buddha was able to wake up and show us a path supposedly was because there's gaps because it's actually not eternal. If you had an eternal self, there'd be no gaps in your experience. You'd feel like you're fully you um, all the time. There's no reason to, but because there are gaps where you get really afraid of something, you're like, or someone says something that just hits on something that clicks into childhood and you're like, wow, look at me. I'm burning up because of this. Or like, I feel so, wow, what's this coming from? What happened to me when I was six, you know? It feels so alien. Like, who's, who's doing this reaction? Why am I crying over this? You should try having PMS. It's very interesting. Oh, interesting. The I only have, times where, right. I, I'm not as bad as some, but there are times where something happens and it might be slightly moving. A television advertisement, uh-huh. something sweeps somebody celebrates a birthday, I don't know. And suddenly these like giant, as my family would say, alligator tears, just <laughs> dripping. <laughs> and there's me that's saying, it also can happen while drunk. <laughs> I go from the happy drunk to like the miserable drunk without warning, like one sip and all of a sudden it rounded the, the apex of the mountain. <laughs> and suddenly I'm like looking at that saying, it's so interesting because she's not sad. She's just hysterical. Like what's, what's that? And then, and then I realized like, oh, sh- I did the thing with the drink or I'm like, wait a minute. The next day I'm like, oh, yeah, DMS, it's weird. Yeah, like I hate to, I don't want to ever feel like I know what's happening and I'm going to be a bitch for a week out of every month. But like sometimes right. I'm like, well, I was emotionally unstable. Right. I can acknowledge that in the moment. Like, why is that so moving? Right. This is sad. Right. And that, right. In fact, cause that wasn't even very good writing. <laughs> and it was pretty poorly acting. Or I don't care if it's that person's birthday. It don't matter to me. Like, it's right. just like, they can be kind of happy tears, but I'm like, what are these tears? So I know that feeling of the alien yes. tears. You're like, I'm reacting. There's, a, there's something that is... This body has produced mm-hmm. some tears. Right. And I don't feel like I'm being disingenuous. It's not right. like I'm crying because I want to act involved. It's more just like, wait, what? Right. Who are you kidding? And you kind of feel exactly. powerless to um to the chemical reactions in your body kind right. of Right. I don't know what your excuse is as not not boozing it up and not right. helping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a beautiful example. I lived with um my partner who had um, pretty 
um, I would say, intense PMS for a bout of time for maybe two or three years. And I totally experienced that. And I would realize it. And sometimes she wouldn't realize it for a while. That she just like, and then she'd be like, oh, okay. And she'd burst out in front. Yeah, yeah. And you you know this about your body. You know, this is an every month thing. And it's still decades into this. It's like, oh, that's. Yeah, you know, like I was just, yes. I was just itchy, and you're like, it's, it's the chemicals. You realize how, what a chemical creature you are, right? Because it always, those moments, it just, I don't like. There's a disconnect of like, I'm really not this upset, right, right, right. <laughs> but I sure am in the middle of it, and right. nobody will question if I'm really in. Like, <laughs> not question because right. like, they don't even dare <laughs> blame this on what I just drank. I'm like, right. Of course, not what I just drank. You know, it's like that weird. Yes. Like, oh, I'm being genuine, but I also feel like this is really uncalled for. <laughs> right, right. I think that's such, I, I didn't even think of it. Only, only you and I can go into PMS <laughs> to understand emptiness and the, the problem of Hitler. Um. <laughs> well, also, Christian, this reminds me, too, of that feeling of, of powerlessness over your identity or your reactions. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you've heard about this, and I mean, we might be getting so far into the weeds that none of this has to come up at all in the real podcast, but there's that weird thing, and I should look up the name of it. It's a medical condition that if Mm. you get a head injury Mm. and you come to, well, like it's not everybody, but it's a rare thing and it's very real, you have a totally different identity. Mm. And it's not like, oh, I like all my clothes to be navy, but no, now I like gray. It's not that simple. It's like, your least favorite foods not your favorite food. Mm. You speak, you can speak fluently in a different language you've never learned. Wow. Um, you know, like you're now an animal lover and before you were afraid of dogs. Like it's, it's the craziest thing and it can wear off. So I actually, I, I know this becomes like a friend of a friend of a friend story, right. but my sister and her family would go to the, all the high school football games and her son was really close to like the quarterback on the team. One day they're playing a game a few years ago terrible tackle like really bad fall everyone knew it was bad like the helmet pops off it's bad and this kid who's their really good friend who they really love he's at knocked out cold right Mm. he Mm. comes to christian (laughs) with a british accent Mm. and he can't stop laughing at it he's not an impressionist amazing he's not trying to mess with people and he hears this coming out of his own mouth and he's like Wow. That's not me. He, as soon as his concussion went away, he got back to normal. Right. But this is a real thing. Like if it was like, oh, he's such a prankster and he been practicing his British accent. He was using slang right. that he doesn't know. He's never been to the right. UK. Right. So what the hell is that? So it's almost, it's like a, a tap on the head. And it's one thing to be like, oh, I I used to like spicy food, but now it's gross. Like, no, right. it, languages. Mm. What? I kind, right. of, I kind of wish I could get a knock on the head and be like, I'm going right. to become a friend. <laughs> right, that's beautiful. That's all I need to become the person that I want to be. <laughs> that's you know, actually, like, oh. yes, that's, that's the Buddhist teaching, exactly. I, I, I love that. But what, I mean, like, for me, that's, that's, a, that's a biological, that's a physical, that's a body-brain right. thing. Right. But it, I think it also speaks to our perception of self. Yes. If it's that easy... Yes. You know, a bop on the head. Uh, it, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I, I almost yeah. feel like it's a weekly weird, like, weekly world news or, like, a tabloid fake, like... Right. Don't it's kill the tabs. But it's, it seems to be a real thing. And I, I would yeah. question my, my sister's like, this kid is not kidding. And he's back to normal. I would call her every day. Have you talked to him? Right. <laughs> Can I talk to him? <laughs> right. Um. But I love that he just had a sense of humor about it. And I feel like he kept doing something in class to get excused. Like he used it as, oh, I think he nice. kept pretending to be dizzy. Right. Oh, pip, pip. <laughs> oh, dear. He was being crikey. And it was so funny. That's so funny. I, he was I, working it. I, I, I really like those stories. I think they point out a few things that I think are worth touching on, which is um, just in thinking about that, Again, going back to the idea that if there weren't any gaps, then we couldn't we couldn't solve the um, we could there couldn't be any enlightened beings 
basically. So some people see animals as like not, I mean, what used to happen in neuroscience early on, I think in like, I don't know, 50s, 60s, um, they used to split open animals that they didn't believe had um, feelings. So there was this difference between emotions and feelings, right? Emotions were um, uh, neurophysiological happenings. So, so maybe the amygdala goes off when you're having a fear reaction or you feel afraid or terror. Um, and maybe some other brain regions are going off during that. And you say, okay, an emotion has happened. Feeling is the conscious experience of that. So we used to make this division between animals and humans and say, well, animals don't have feelings, but they have emotions. So then we would um, not give animals anesthetics and split open their heads. Because they're like, oh, it's just a reaction. It's just a habit. You know, this is just a, a me mechanical machine. And so it's just reacting the way it does, but it doesn't actually experience the feeling of getting its head split open with a scalpel. Humans are terrible, aren't we? Funny creatures. Um, but again, I think it's because we, it's through this discrimination, which um, proved to be, it's hard to say if it was proved to be incorrect, but at, at, the, at some, some level of um, understanding is that we don't know, so we should tread cautiously rather than pretending that we do know. And so we made that distinction between emotion and feelings. And we also had the, like you said, the, the um, we had witchcraft trials, but we also had um, what we used to do to epileptic patients who would seize, who think they're having a seizure. Um, and we know scientifically more of what's going on, what's the neurobiology, of their seizures, right? We can look at it physiologically and through the brain. Back then, we actually used to take some of those people and lop their heads off because we thought they were uh, some sort of sorcery or witchcraft. Um, they were seizing, so they had the devil in them. So, and sometimes we would even perform um, exorcisms on them. And then as, as this progressed, we started to become more scientifically inclined and said, oh, that's not the devil activating this person. They have this thing in their brain that's not actually operating in the way that it should, causing seizures. But the thing that I want to add is, and Robert Sapolsky, who's a neurobiologist at, at Stanford, who also lived in uh, parts of Africa with baboons for um, uh, quite some time, said that Eventually, what's going to happen, you're going to find out that there is no dividing line. In fact, everything is, has a chemical basis. So um, the fact that we think that when I'm on PMS, I'm outside of my own control, right? Or when I get hit on the head, I'm outside of my own control. I'm not who I think I am in those moments that that's just another discrimination. That instead what's happening is you have this stream of consciousness that is, uh, and it looks pretty confirmable on the neuroscience side and on the, um, in these traditions, 2,500 year old traditions say, okay, so you have a stream of consciousness that is not connected at all. And so you have something that tries to tie those together. So you have this thought literally disconnected from the next thought, but the way that we experience it as a narrative. So something is operating to loop those together. And part of that is, a huge part of that is our language. We're able to weave together these stories, but there's also other parts that are not language-based because we know other animals do that without doing that. So we have this sense of self that um, we keep telling ourselves about the story that's happening as I'm moving through. When I go to the restroom, I think I'm going to the restroom, right? But um, I saw um, um, someone who was here who had a kind of a degenerative, neurodegenerative issue, and he would often forget where he's going in the middle of where he's going. And we have these experiences. This is not just him. He had it at an extreme level to where you can look at it. But even as like, I think like 
I don't know if I should use myself as an example, but when I was like nine years old, I had the, those sort of experiences. Like I was going to the, oh yeah, I was going to the bathroom. Now I remember, like you get far like, out. Yeah, right? I mean, I think everyone has the experience of like, okay, I just have to go into the room and get that thing and you go in there and you're like, why am I in here again? Right, right. Okay, try to track your, try, like you we had to come in here to grab one thing. Right. Like, it's so strange when you're like, I was on a mission. It was the right. one thought in my head. I got myself in here. Right. I have no idea what it was. Right. It's weird. It's like a, it's like a reset button where you're like, I didn't press reset right. on purpose. It wasn't like I spent, I'm like, I'm going to have a moment in contemplation and clear my mind. Right. It was not optional. It was like, it just was almost like came out of the ether and just knocks you on your butt and makes you think like, what the heck was, what was that? Yeah. Like, why did I? flip out. I can't even imagine that guy who does it all the time. Um, yeah. It kind of makes me think about, and I'm not sure if we should get into this because I don't know a lot about these medical conditions. And I do think that they are very much real. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say that they're, I almost feel like they in some ways might be an advantage to finding the gaps. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Tourette syndrome, mm-hmm. people who don't have control over right. a, a verbal tick or a, or a body tick where it's like, in, in their heads, they're thinking, I, I don't want to do this. I mean, I guess it's some, similar to epilepsy. Like, no one's like, now right. would be a great time for a seizure. Right. Um, you know, like, it's just out of your hands. It's kind of like you're sitting on, on a fault line, like an earthquake, and it's just going to happen, and you can't right. control it. Also, OCD. Like, right. the knowing, like, and probably going to counseling and, like, understanding, like, I don't have to touch the doorknob 40 times. Mm-hmm. I know I just washed it, too, so I don't have to wash my hands. I'm like got to touch it because otherwise you might die like it's weird it's like you know i feel like that's kind of like a a more exaggerated version of the pms story or something like it's Mm -hmm. you you're not functioning all you're not you are oh (laughs) you are separate right from certain thoughts that are happening compulsions that are happening right that you can't help right you're not identified with them you're not in the center of them Right. You actually feel a victim of your own actions and you think, right. stop it, and you can't stop it. Right. And that, right. that's weird. Yes. And that, <laughs> that's, that like be, you said. Is that a step closer to enlightenment if you look at it and go, wow, look at that. Like people have other things that aren't quite as drastic. Other people right. don't have to you know, touch every step with their toe three times when going up a staircase. But they right. don't realize that they're, they have their thing that might be less visible to everybody, and they'll never know they're doing it. Whereas I right. get to know that what my body does and what this human animal mind of mine needs to do physically is not my thoughts because my thoughts do not match. Right. So are they right. a bit – do they have – I don't want anyone to be like, lucky you, you have epilepsy. You have a window into right. – Enlightenment. Like, that sounds really terrible, so I want to be mindful of that. But it does feel like an invitation to – Yes. understand in a way that most of us don't have something that alarming that we'll yeah. figure out. What I think is, is great about what you're saying is that um, what's happening there, I think, is that so evolutionarily speaking, um, looking at our biology, it would be good if our consciousness is uninterrupted and um, that the whole act of I'm this agent is goes through mostly flawlessly. We have a little area which we call instinct or um, reflex that we pretend is like a little area that we can say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not me when I do that, right? There's all there's the, and so people that have these other disorders. So a lot of people have accepted I'll have a reflex. So if someone throws something at me, am I the one that moved? You know, if someone tries to do something or um, am I the one that did that? And it's like, no, it just happened. And you have people who, um, there's stories about like this neighbor who saw something, um, you have longer versions of that where this neighbor who saw a fire happening and the fire people were just getting there and they heard a kid scream and just went in did whatever they had to do under adrenaline and so forth came out and they interviewed him later and said, why did you go in? You're such a good person. You're such, you're amazing. And he is like, I don't know what happened. 
I yeah. just heard it and I, I just, and he and he literally told them if I had thought about it I wouldn't have done it yeah right and he's he's having the and people are trying to say no you are just a good person actually <laughs> you're a saint right. you have some essential quality eternal um, quality um, yourself is is this good guy rather than like I, I'm not actually in control of myself and I don't know why why that just occurred it's almost like he in that moment and like other mm -hmm. people other people with stories like that of, of just complete hero, heroism that doesn't hesitate mm -hmm. it is similar to a reflex but is that that could be a, that could be a moment where you realize like like you're almost in a blackout it's almost mm -hmm. it's the pure mm -hmm. adrenaline and it's not even a question it's not debating pros and cons you right. just have superhuman strength and you lift the car off the baby you do the crazy thing that you're like wasn't really me because if you right. knew me I would have made a list. <laughs> pros, the kid lives. Cons, right. I can't really lift a car. My hurt my back. Right. If you knew me, I think about things too long. Like I right. think for order in a restaurant. Like right. I'm not the person that runs toward danger, but like right. it's in front of you and you do it, and it's almost like you become a portal. Mm -hmm. to do like an essential good. That's like when you're like I. I actually don't even really remember it. It was such right. a blur. It's like right. out of box. Like something else took over. Right. And it's. Like putting aside the ego, right. like not just from a, like, this might kill me standpoint, which is right. huge, but also just like a knowing what to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the spontaneity. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I don't know if it's easy for everyone to tap into that. I think it really depends on the situation. Like there was just that cop that those two cops that were just shot and the, the woman, have you seen that? It's terrible. Um, these two cops were sitting in a car. I think it was in Compton. And a gunman who they don't have, they don't know, but there's video from the street cam, so you don't get very close, but can't, shot them both in the car. They're just sitting there. And there's like a guy in his 20s and a woman in her 30s. And she's shot in the chest and the face. And she, she gets her like partner to safety. And she radios in. And they're both like, in, you know, in critical condition, it looks like they're going to make it. They're going to be permanently disfigured. They're fucked for life. They both lived, but she, I mean, that's what I'm like. I think I honestly think I'd be like, well, that game over. Uh, look over mm. here. He's shot. Look over right. here. Oh, half my face is gone. Right. It's been a good show. Um, good night and God bless. Like, right. game over for me. But like her, she, she sprung into action and dragged him. I'm like, where is she getting that? How? Like I haven't right. watched the video. All of it's all of it's recorded. Right. Uh, and like they didn't they didn't die. That's something. But like that kind of Right. She has training. She's a cop. Like she Right. She might have a high pain threshold. She's a mom. She's given birth. She's probably like, this is nothing. I've pushed a baby out. Like, who knows what her factors are. So in a weird way, you kind of expect someone who says they're gonna serve and protect. You would hope, I mean, in this world you don't know, um, but you would hope that they had that superhuman strength but i wonder if she looks back and she's like i have no idea how i did that right you know I, of course you'd opt to do it if you thought you could but I, i'm sure she's like i didn't know i had it in me i mean it's just fucking crazy so right. it's, it's really interesting that other people might not have it in them so i don't know right. what that yeah that, let's let's play with that i really like i think um to start with the proposition that let's start with the idea that you're always like that. There's no moment when you're actually an agent. And the, the idea of, the, of consciousness is partially to fabricate the agent. That's it. That you're actually never acting. But the way you have knowledge in the world is like you separate these things into biology and all these different things because we've been given this knowledge and you don't need an agent to do that. So you have this discrimination which i also have but i also observe as being likely false is that when i think of because i've been trained in studying neurobiology and and um uh, working in two labs i've been trained a lot to think about well how much cortisol was in that person's system right so i start to have this idea that there's some parts of the story that are automated 
and there's some parts of and everyone has pretty much a different one. Like you don't need neuroscience to believe that. You just need, um, oh, um, people used to think sexual desire is completely um, no agent. You're just a wild beast, you know. Um, and now there's like, you know, but what about Karma Sutra? <laughs> and there's, there's all sort of ways we keep splitting up and trying to find the space of human activity. And I think what also scares us about things like um, um, robots is the idea of the automaton, is the idea of that there isn't, there doesn't necessarily need to be this conscious moral agent that's doing all these things. So what if we start with the idea that free will um, is literally a fabrication that helps us biologically and to say that there is no space in which we are not um, acting um, as a fabricated agent that isn't doing anything, that everything is actually just happening within itself um, because of our biology. Um, why do we need there to be an agent? An acting agent. Well, if we don't have an acting agent, I'm just, I mean, I'm already inactive already. I take about a hundred steps a day. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> inactive agent. I mean, like what are, it just, that goes against, to me, I'm like, okay, so we can get really philosophical about it, but like you got to wake up and you'll get hungry. If you don't eat, eventually you'll die. <laughs> you gotta, right. like, and it, like, but I'm hungry. saying it takes care of yourself. It takes care of itself. You can keep pretending that you have an agent or don't have an agent. You're still going to take care of yourself. Who's doing the taking care of um, is what I'm debating here. I'm not saying that you're not acting. I just think you're just observing the whole thing. The only thing you have access to is this fabricated experience that you're having a, that you're this person. And I think that's why you can easily take drugs like psychedelics and feel like you're no one. Uh, why, why would it be that these heroic acts, these, and uh, these heroic acts, these drugs, these um, psychological impairments, um, these advances in sciences uh, have begun to make us really uh, question the idea that you're an agent. Not saying that nothing will get done if you're not an agent. Um, the point would be is that people try to have transcendent experiences with psychedelics, right? Um, to touch the, you know, the one, the many, the blah, blah, blah. Um, and what we, why that's strange is actually when people um, report on psychedelics when they're having this oneness experience, they're still operating. They're going to the store. They're having a hamburger. They go home to go onions sleep. onions from the gutter and eating it yes. like now. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is my experience. Uh, and the suffering of barking dogs. Right. And I'm totally not doing anything. But this body, this mind is doing lots of things. But I can see that, oh, I'm not doing anything. What? Then who am I? Am I... Because when you, when you say that you still have to get up and cook, you're talking about the body, you're talking about a bunch of yeah. things we're projecting eye onto. I, I'm just not, yeah. And I think it might be, a, it also might be a dead end, but the, the point that I'm making is that the stream of consciousness, I think the evidence suggests much more in favor that there's not an agent. That we are, that it's, favorable to biology for our this this body to imagine that it has an agent that it's controlling things that it thinks that it's operating on these things when it, in essence it's not but that's okay um but we take that to be i'm definitely me because i'm definitely not katie right um but yet somehow people can go on psychedelics. Like I knew of this couple that went on psychedelics and they said they like switched identities. They're like you're Yuhan and I'm Fatima. And they switched in this moment of like really believing they're Yuhan and really believing they were Fatima. And so they Are we going to have to get high together, Christian? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it sounds like we need some uh, some mushrooms of some yes, sort to stop. understand. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, but to me, okay. So I'm having trouble understanding the agent, the mm -hmm. the one with a, the agent is the agency. The mm -hmm. the I'm trying to think of it as agency because I, I get like okay, mm -hmm. the fact. See, for me, the fact that in your experience, which you can speak to, and I'm sure mm -hmm. mirrors a lot of others, if they could articulate it, you're observing the thoughts you're getting from the, the people and the animals and the onions you're encountering. Mm -hmm. There's that level, and there's also you realizing like, oh, wow, I'm really experiencing, like there's this, this out of body kind of observation of the person that, of the sensory that you're having, right? right? So you've got this disconnect. That to me proves that, like, it proves that there is something there. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't take this trip and all of a sudden all you are is like, it was just open expanses and reality melted away and there was nothing but the one, the many, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Like To me, the fact that you're still having sensory, I mean, there's something, I don't know, it just seems like there's a middleman there. Mm -hmm. To me, instead of proving that there isn't, I'm thinking that's the, that's middleman stuff. Mm -hmm. Like the you who's over here, and then you with the onion. Like this you is like the bridge between the bigger thing, right? Consciousness and like this crazy experience that this guy over here is having, who happens right. to be what you call you. Right, and that's 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 the Hinduic Brahmin insight. you that I get it. Right. I'm a Brahmin. I don't yeah. know. I, don't. I mean, that's that's really the insight right there that you hit on. That's definitely not the Zen expression of that as far as its soul, but it's definitely the Brahmanic. Like the Brahmin is this, like, but what that requires is you're not Katie. You're not the personality. You're not, when you say, I'm a Democrat complete falsification. I am my body, complete falsification. I'm right. any, right? But the thing is, the way that some of the Brahmin uh, texts read is like, you actually somehow, which is very strange, I, I don't really understand it exactly, that you delude yourself into thinking, oh, you're actually this one instance. And then you get addicted to the things that you are in form. So you're like, I got to stay pretty. I got to keep this skin, this skin bag up, you know, um, but, but right. And to the Brahmin, it's like your pure awareness never changes that there is something changeless. You always have this awareness, no matter how old you are, no matter how many diseases you have. The uh, one interpretation of this Brahmin is that, you're nothing but awareness. So the, the way they've described it very strangely to me is that there's a TV and there's a screen and there's stuff happening on the screen. And you're even a part of the screen. Like you're, um, sorry, this, the, the form you is also there. So Katie is going around IDO and talking to everyone, blah, blah, blah. But the argument is you're the screen. Change those. So I'm not, I'm not what's, I'm not what's, I'm not the show that's on. Right. And I'm not, I'm not the particles in the air that are picked up by the transmitter or whatever it is now. Right. Just, what the fuck is that? I don't know. I need to talk to IT. I'm not, <laughs> I don't get any comedy ears on top of my, I'm not Elvis Presley sitting there with my gun on my three channels with the gravity <laughs> ears on the TV. Um, yeah, I need to get with this century. But like, I get that. See, I, I was going to say, it almost seems, okay, I just, I'm not convinced that, I, I think that we're supposed to be stuck in these roles. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't be. Like, I think we're only here to be stuck in this and try to crack it open. Like, we're like an egg and we're trying to crack the shell. Mm -hmm. Not everyone cracks it. Some people are happy being the yolk inside the egg. But like, it feels like some people are trying to, like, hatch from the inside, you know? Like, right, right. I think we're supposed to all be that egg. Mm -hmm. And some people might... They're like, well, I, it's a bad analogy. I'm trying to think, like, it almost feels like, I don't get why we're here, but it feels like we're supposed to be worldly. Otherwise, we wouldn't have come to this world. And it's almost like, a, it's like we're in a panic room 
one of those places that people pay to be trapped in a room and try to figure out how to get out. I'm like, yeah, have fun with that. I have mm. absolutely no interest in being locked in a room with you trying to figure out how to get out. We're right. paying to do this. Right. Like, but, but people pay to do it. You know, like right. I want to prove that I can get out. Like, it's almost like we came here with varying levels of ability to detect right. what the goal is. Mm. Hmm, interesting. Some people just get caught up like, I can live in this escape room. I can live, this is pretty nice. It's right. got a lot of stuff in it and I look pretty good and like that person's hot and like, I don't mind being in this escape room. Right. And other of us are like, wait, is light coming through that crack in the wall? Right. Is there a hinge on that wall? Like, is there a lever? Should we try all the candlesticks? Try all the books. Does the door mm -hmm. open? Like, mm -hmm. What's going on here? Like, I feel like not everyone gets that curious, but I feel like right. the whole point is to hope that we do. Mm. It's like a puzzle. Like, we're in the Rubik's Cube. It's the Matrix. Shit. That always comes back to Keanu, doesn't it? All I things know. lead to Keanu. I know. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know what the, the goal is, but staying in the panic room, it seems to accumulate to, or, like, lead to biology's supposed, you know, what biology wants. And I think that's been the, the reason the Buddha and all these people were like, wait, I get that this body wants me to survive. <laughs> and all these mechanisms, I get it. But it doesn't seem that fun to just survive. Like, I, I'm jealous. I, I, and this body, it gets old. It gets all these things right and um and there's nations warring with each other it doesn't seem to me to be working at another level right it seems to be working at the level of like yes humans are now populating the earth Whew, great job biology thank you it but, seems like right. it's a classroom in a bad education system <laughs> You know, like, there's no teachers that make any <laughs> sense. They're not teaching the right subjects. Everyone's goofing off. Everyone's ignoring the rules. Mm. You know, it, it, people don't care about who's sitting next to them. They didn't do their homework. They're not putting in the work. It just feels like we're in a classroom. It's just like mm. you've been in a lot of different classrooms in your life. I'm sure you went to some schools where you're like, damn, these kids do their homework. And they the questions that they're asking, <laughs> holy shit, law school I went to. Like, they burn their books and, like, <laughs> Nobody, everyone was hungry. Nobody ate anything. Everyone was falling asleep in the class. Like, you know, like there's, I feel like it degenerated somewhere. <laughs> um, but the, I, I still think like it gives weirdly the fact that it's falling apart seems to right. for some people on to have more awareness than they otherwise would if it was totally comfortable. The fact that right, right. there's yeah. so many like literal and figurative fires burning right now where it's like, um, right. I was alive for a while where I didn't really feel like there was a single fire of, you know, but like, what is this right. shit show? But it, right. it's a nice, um, it's just the compounding, compounding of it where you're like, all right. It's like hitting snooze a million times and getting another alarm. You're like, okay, we've mm. got like eight alarms going right in on top of each other. The clock radio is going, the phone is going, the stereo is going, the neighbors are banging on the door. <laughs> like there's so many alarms at one time right. where if you're gonna wake up, this is this is the right. time when you start to wake up. Yeah, that is interesting. I want to be um, cautious of your time because I think we had yeah. this until five. Um, I, I should probably go soon, but like I'm wondering. I also want to think about the title. We have mm -hmm. time, but yeah. um, I don't know if you've heard of a show called uh, Stranger Things. I haven't. Oh, watched I it, have. But there's the upside down in it, um, and I. I have only seen part of season one, so I can't speak to the upside down, but the upside down is like the weird scientific, like 11, the, the little girl goes in there and fights monsters and shit. I don't know what's going okay. on with the upside down, but I almost feel like we should avoid the phrase upside down. Uh, it just yeah. invokes that. I'm sure there's a ton of philosophy that would, that would like layer onto the show, but I can't speak yeah. to the show. Yeah. Um, for me, like if I saw that, I'm like, oh, they're going to talk about how like the illusion of life is like the upside down from Stranger Things. Oh, I see. So I do think we don't have to go with this topic, and we should um, 
part of what I want to make sure we do is um, is to come out of it because I think like it's not I say it to, in a way that's more philosophical because that's the way I, I've kind of learned about it linguistically or whatever but the truth is within the experience and that um, that experience, like you said, if, if our job is to, who knows what our overall goal is um, in life, who really knows, like, God. Um, uh, but at least what we can see is that uh, that reality isn't what it seems. I don't know what it is. And the way Dogen talked about it was, like, there's a guy that said, painted rice cakes will never um, fill your stomach in Zen. And then Dogen was like, painted rice cakes will never fill painted hunger. Ooh. Right. I love that. And his, po <laughs> his, po his point was that there is no veil in which that you lift up and you're like, there's the real rice cakes. There are, there's the real hunger. Now I get to solve my real hunger with these real rice cakes. He was giving us a reality that actually everything is imagined. You cannot get to some objective world because we have these sensory impressions, kind of like what you're saying. Even though we are the, the source or whatever, our input is always going to be transformed before we even experience it, right? So the input of me looking at this view completely transform. I cannot get a view without transformation. My eyes are not objective readers of this, whatever is be, whatever I, I, it's very strange, right? Like opening my eyes and seeing the world, um, everything just shows up to me. I just assume this is, this is totally the way things exist. Not knowing that, you know, we know this from um, several cognitive tests, right? You know, light hitting the eye and that there's no color, and but yet we process things with color. We have all these like hints that something's really off. Like you said, there's cracks everywhere. And the more we get into science of the mind, we see there's just gigantic um, cracks everywhere. And we can't crack consciousness because partially because of this, that there's no solid ground to Conscious, but going back into what I was saying, so we process that with our eyes. As soon as it's here, as soon as it hits, it's already processed. Why? Because then we also have a certain type of hardware, right? Like these certain types of eyes. So not only is the data transformed when we get it, our mechanism of light hitting these sort of jelly blah, 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 totally transforms the experience to where um, I guess octopi are developed similar eyes, but to where something with like flies, we don't really know what that would be like. We try to have guesses, but the point is reality. It, it, we never come into contact with it. And if that's the case, we can't get to some, because I used to think we're going to finally get to an objective world. That, that's my point of studying and stuff. Like all the cognitive biases, I wanted to just rid myself of every bias. And then I would see the objective world, just rid myself of bias, right? Like I don't want to have all those. We got into that kind of science of like, oh, we just have all these biases. When we see someone, we think the peak end, the peak end uh, experience issue, which is if they experience, I really... Um, summarize my experience wherever the peak was. So if the film has this really awesome peak, when I go back to um, evaluate it, I'm going to evaluate it with the end or the peak at a very high probability. And so we thought, okay, we just list all the biases, scrape those away, and then we have a perfect person seeing a perfect reality. But what it looks like is we, we're never going to have access to some objective reality. So we have to, supposedly the salvational quality is to not take um, our, what we're seeing as, as eternal, as really 
essentially there. When I experience Katie, because of my mechanism, my condition, I really experience her as a set of attributes, as an image. So Katie, even when I'm in contact with you in person, you're still an image. Right. But I think there's something in the fact that it's kind of built in. Right. Like, it's great because, like, physically, like, things change. Like, my hair will get longer. Or every mm -hmm. seven years, all your cells regenerate. Like, right. even if you're like, that person never changes, everything about them has already changed. And right. No one can get beyond aging. And sure, you can fill yourself with fillers, but now you look like a freak. So it's like, you're still different right. than you were. Uh, there's no freezing anything. And, yeah, you can be like, oh, I've seen a million winters. But maybe... Right. The weather's a little harsher or a lot more mild or like I've seen a lot of summers. I've seen some smoky skies. Like I have not seen this before. Like never seen an orange day before. Like, like right. even you're like, Oh, it's another one of these crazy summers. It's like, it's right. not like the last one. It won't be like the no. next one. Nothing. Like, yeah. The waves on the shore, like the snowflakes. I mean like it's built. In, it just feels it's so obvious. In. Yeah. It's built into every single thing right. that including like your own existence, your own cellular structure. Right. Nothing is permanent. Right. Like there is no eternal, it is empty. Right. And it just feels like, I just feel like we're going to die. And it's going to be like, Hey, remember how we said it was empty or how you had some clues there? You were right. And we're going to be like, but I, it was so hard to grasp all the time. Like, God, I thought so. Like, I just right. have a feeling like, oh, that's the end of the joke. Like, that's the end of the movie. Like, hey, did you not notice that as soon as you get used to be, it being daytime, it starts to get darker? Or, like, <laughs> or as soon as you get used to the moon being full, and you're like, it's so pretty. All of a sudden, it's half the size, and you're like, wait. <laughs> just a couple days ago, it was better. Like, you know, like, right. every, every, like we're rotating, so, like, this, where's the where are the stars in the sky? Like, Right. We're, we're rotating and I'm like, oh, that we can't see that constellation in this season from this hemisphere. Right. Like, but it's star. Like, it just feels like it's so baked in. Like there is yeah. no permanence. It, it, the only thing permanent is non-permanence. Right. right. And then we can't even fathom it where I'm like, right. how many clues right. do we ask holes need? Yes. That's, That's all there is. Yes. That's it. Yeah. And in our, and it, but it does make sense that our biology, also impermanent, wants it to be different. Because in order to survive, right? Like I need a food source that's reliable. I need heat. I need all of these things. And if I can have them in vast quantities where I can reliably get it, capitalism, of course capitalism is a dream. They think it's a Western dream. I think it's just a dream of permanence, of um, and it may be cooked up in a certain Western flavor, but it's everywhere. There's no, yeah. right? Permanent seeking. Capitalism is a result of permanent seeking, right? Um, and we, we, it feels like we have sort of permanence, right? We can feel a semi-permanence of like Amazon. Right. Right? Like now more than ever, it's like, well, even if the road has a pothole in it, it's going to be paved. Right. Like, right. like that wasn't a thing for until like 50 years ago. There wasn't even a highway structure like <laughs> 70 years ago. That was yeah. post World War II. Like, you know, it'd be really cool if we had ways to get from city to city. Right. Like that was new. Like what? Like it was little back country roads and one lane highways and tiny little side streets. And uh, right. with the amount that we take for granted because of the comfort level. Right. But I feel like it almost makes that hunger for understanding worse because when everything's handed to you and you're still flummoxed, mm. like, okay, th my life is pretty convenient compared to the pioneers mm. or like my ancestors even a hundred years ago. Mm. Like I've got medicines, I've got easy ways of getting food. I've got indoor plumbing. I've got like, like most of their concerns uh, are not my concerns. Like we, we moved on up. Like we're, we have other things to worry about, but instead it's like the anxiety right. that it's something takes its place. Mm. And I would, I would say that that's when we, we make the shift. So that's a great moment, I think, for the shift. So if we go off the premise that we used to go off this kind of premise, and some of us still do, that there are a finite amount of needs. But we're finding in capitalism that there isn't. 
that actually the the stores uh, that are you know worth the most um, are usually like Amazon that have everything and continue to add more and more and more things. We have the we have probably billions of trinkets. And in my so, apartment alone, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> right, which is which is not a problem. But the point I'm trying to make is that it again it's like that turn is I think you're hitting on it and I think you're hitting on it in a kind of profound way is that you keep when you when you play the at uh, the what is it called the logic ab absurdium or whatever when you play it to the end right when you take something to the end um, out to close to infinity nearing infinity you see that actually if you stay in that same model where basically all of these structures become slow moving structures over time right um, like um, civil planning and all these sort of things, buildings and securing ourselves, um, uh, although we're getting much more efficient with it, there seem to just be more needs popping up. So yeah. it's not as if you could just finish it, right? right. It's like, I just, I just give you semi-permanence, really good semi-permanence for all the basic needs, right? And then, then we should be better, right? We should be good at that. But you find out, no, there's, there's plastic surgery. There's going to be, I mean, in the future, you can imagine, you know, um, eye color change. You can imagine a manipulation of form to the max. And we're all going to be chipped with God knows what. And like, oh, right. Dan, your chip has that speed on it. I mean, right. As long as there's that. Last year's chip in me. Exactly. Like, or last week's, because it'll be so fast then. <laughs> yeah. I have last, you know, the last eight hour chip or whatever will be. Exactly. And I'll say, well, good for permanent use. And then two years, we're like, we're sorry. You can't upgrade the OS for your stupid chip. I'm so sorry. Or the charger doesn't work for you right. anymore. We don't right. make those chargers anymore. It's like they're going to get us. <laughs> right. The exactly. main thing. I just, it's so annoying. Like my exactly. parents had the same, same hi-fi to listen to music for like 40 years. Right. It's like we bought a really good stereo, pretty mm. good speakers. We got a record player and it has an AM FM radio. Right. And they never had to buy another thing until I was fucking old enough to remember. And then it was like, oh, get rid of the A track. Quick, get, get a cassette player. Oh no, right. we don't use cassettes. Get a CD right. player. Oh, now we need an MP3 player. I'm like, I've right. bought this song 40 times in different formats. Can we stop right. it? Like right. my parents had a record. Like <laughs> and that was good for 40 years. Like right. what's up with all the rapid fire? It just yeah. won't stop. Yes. And that, and that is happening. Like, we can say that at the physical level, maybe the materials were less back then and simpler, but what we cannot say for sure is that the mental um, needs, mental needs I think are the same. We can, we can keep splicing up. Our minds are so discriminatory making boxes and boxes and boxes. I need this type of, I mean, um, the, also the more sophisticated we become, but still stuck in this kind of seeking permanence, you know, the worse it can get as well. Cause now I'm like, I didn't have this attachment style when I was younger and this attachment style leads to this. So I need this type of love. Mom, are you giving me this type of love? Like it becomes to the point of, of, we have this in, in finite ability to discriminate between um, this blending, this weird line between wants and needs. It's not clear. Um, and so what you said was profound to me because um, it's everywhere. It's pervading everything in permanence. It's absolutely, and in ways, in some ways we do take it on as beautiful, but this mind definitely want, seems to want it to be different. And so the question, um, the profound part that I thought you said was, um, and I'm paraphrasing it is, <clears throat> given we see that it's penetrating everything, it penetrates all, no matter what, that, and the first thing that goes off the list is some sort of technological or uh, material um, uh, salvation, right? Um, which a lot of people have switched. Like if you could say religion has switched from God, this, whatever that was, to materials. Like, well, I can have a happy happiness through getting all these things. We know that that's not going to work. 
um, but we think we think it's going to work and it's the best thing we really have um, and so then we have this uh, seeking 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 until we find out that the seeking is inexhaustible that the penetration of impermanence everywhere that everything is empty like this and eventually goes away um, gives us a chance to like you said wake up but i don't know if this time makes us more susceptible susceptible to waking up or not but what is clear to me is that there has to be another game to play because or else we wouldn't have access to the gaps right like it's clear to me that that is like those nuggets of insight that help us go oh yeah Maybe I'm not who I think I'm. Maybe the world isn't what it seems, just a little eerie. And I think kids, a lot of times kids are the ones that um, are often pointed out as having that sort of beginner's mind. And that beginner's mind, taking everything fresh, seeing it fresh as it comes and goes, is impermanence down to the moment. Yeah. Right? So living in the presence, present or living in the moment is actually totally accepting impermanence and emptiness, right? Mm -hmm. Right there in the moment you're there, um, completely knowing that this, that moment just left you, it's going, it's going fast. That, and I think that aliveness, I think I, I think I told you when I almost, I got really sick when I was a kid and three weeks after I was sick for like three weeks, the whole world was just beautiful. Everything was just fresh, same place. Same exact place. I experienced everything is new. My the dog that we had was totally a weird dog. What are you doing? Everything was just so fresh. I felt like for like three weeks until it eventually went back to like, oh, I know this place. I know what this is like. You know that permanent thinking of fixing everything. The dog is like this. The house is like this. Mom is like this. Dad is like this. Well, I think this is why people travel because it's the easy way of, of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like you step out on the veranda and it's not what you see at home. No matter what it is, it's a change of scenery and you're, and you know, you're not going to live there. Like right. you've paid for that room for two nights. Mm -hmm. And so it's this not needing it, mm. like being free of having it need to last forever because you want it to be a great two nights or you want mm. it to be great right now mm. because you're on vacation right now. And like, it's like, it's like, you've never seen it before. Mm. So it's this kind of freshness to, I mean, if you can get beyond the status, like I want the right. better view. Like if it's, <laughs> if you're not trapped in that, which it can be happen not for a lot of people, but if you have that, like nothing I usually see in my day is around me right now. Mm. And I've never seen this Vista before. Mm. It shouldn't take removing yourself from any physical location to feel right. that. Because a child can do that because that, that child doesn't really realize, like, oh, there's a tomorrow. <laughs> they, right. they don't quite <laughs> like, Tom, there was a yesterday, and they're like, huh? Like, they just haven't quite, right. you know, and, like, it's amazing when you ask kids that, I mean, I, I used to work with really little kids for a long mm. time. And I know mm. those kids wouldn't remember me. And it was years <laughs> of my life. And, like, they loved me. You know, they loved me. And I'm like, right. they don't know who the hell I am. I wouldn't recognize them on the street. And they don't know who the hell I am. And I said, we used to hang out when you were little. I worked at your learning center. Or I worked at your gymboree. Or I used mm -hmm. to be your nanny. They'd be like, sure. Like, <laughs> why would that matter? But, like, in that day, they were so full of, like, mm. love and gratitude. And, like, mm. I was a permanent fixture in their mind. But it was the most fleeting thing. So if I didn't show up the next day, I don't think they would know any different. Like, they're not going to be like, is she late for her appointment? Was she supposed to be here 10? Right, right. I right. don't know. Like, right. So it's just really, it, it, mm. there is that newness to it, which is enviable. But mm. part of me also thinks the only way to really value things, I think the dissatisfaction is baked in. Right. I don't see how you can, I don't see how a human, who we are in this current, incarnation and that that might be where all the meditation stuff comes in maybe there is the way but mm -hmm. for where i am my point of view right now and from my western philosophy point of view i'm like i have to love the dissatisfaction because mm -hmm. only because of it can i really appreciate each moment because i know it's not permanent right and the impermanence is what makes it so cool mm -hmm. you know right. if i thought right. it was right 
I like this life is very, very strange. And like, if I didn't acknowledge the fact that like, I can't take you for granted. Right. I'm not guaranteed another conversation. Like if I can just appreciate this, right. then there's a bit of sweetness to that because then I have to acknowledge like we're mortal. The world is chaotic. Nothing can be counted on. A lot of things stay sa- stable, but then what, and it can all change in one day. Right. So, uh, you know, it's just that, that kind of like, that's part of the game. That's part of this game. Right. Uh, it's the rules. Like you can love things knowing that you might have to let go of them at any right. moment. Right. You I know, love that. It, it seems twisted, but I don't see how you could have, I don't know how else a human being could be. Right. In both of those worlds. Yeah. Yeah. They're one world. Right. Yeah. I think you can be in that world and have a realization. And I think that's why I'd like the term realization because you realize something and then you still experience all of the things, but you experience them. Good. We should call it realization versus quote reality, unquote. Mm. I like that. Yeah, I really like that. And I like the way this is going because I think Monday we, to me, what's coming up to me is like, this is really about change and really about like, presence or like what do we really mean by like be in the present and i like that we took this huge kind of swinging out like not going directly like just be in the moment you know it was much more like reality is the nature of change but we the want the opposite change, the permanence of change mm, that's right the only thing that doesn't change is the fact that everything's changing And so how can we, I think that's what they mean by resting and illusion. So I want, I I would love for you to, I'm going to send you some stuff, ponder what is the salvational, because I think that's what you're playing with as well. And I want to play with that as well, which is if there is salvation, because you've already said it, but I don't know if you really, really have touched it. You said change is the only permanent thing, which we've heard this before. But now think of that in a salvational quality. Like, what does that mean if you could actually live that out? And to me, that's no different than enlightenment. That's exactly, that's a great definition of enlightenment. Is, yeah. is the, the only thing changeless, like you said, is change. And if you can, I think, key, I think the salvation is finding that not to be a hindrance, but it to be a delight. Right. But how, like does, watching, how does one do that? It's like watching a lava lamp. And if all you wanted was a normal lamp, that lamp is not the lamp for you. You'd be sitting there going like, God damn it, the globs. <laughs> and I ordered a lamp and you got globs in it. Like it'd be very distressing. Like I want this to set the mood for my mm. dinner table. And I got these weird organic shapes floating in it like you complain to the one who made it like i this is not the i just want a lamp but right. if you decide that you like wanting a lot like wanting it to watch it constantly glob like and deciding that that's the coolest part of this lamp it's not a flaw it's it's like it keeps changing and that's the whole point like i don't want to return it right like, I, you can decide to be delighted by it or like super irritated by it yeah because like, yeah. you want to control it. it right yeah you can try to minimize it by right. getting all the money, getting all the fame, getting all the plastic surgery, getting whatever it is that your problem is, you know, right. drugs, whatever it is that like makes you feel like you you're you're in control and you're you know you're steering the ship. Mm-hmm. If you just accept that, like, isn't it nice that I'm not steering this ship? Right. right. And that I, every single day is a surprise party. Right. And it's sometimes the shittiest things possible happen i might be bedridden for three weeks and then the three weeks after might be the best three weeks of my life because right. everything's like like the silver lining and everything like this is going to be fun i'm mm-hmm. trapped in my apartment for six plus months and like when i leave think about the newness there like like right. i got in a car and i was like oh jesus i felt like my face was pulling back like i was <laughs> like 25 miles an hour i'm like horsepower jesus christ <laughs> I sit in a chair. That's all I do. Uh, so, you know, like it was really weird. But I'm like, this is now right. I know how people feel when cars were new. And you're like, I think I'll stick to my horse. <laughs> I don't think these cars are the new direction. Uh, because it was like, ooh. Uh, but right. it's like it's like it's just like kind of seeing that 
seeing the opportunity in all of the the change or like appreciating the change is the salvation because it's the one thing you can count on so having that not be a negative mm -hmm. even if it's negative changes in your mind if you're evaluating something as like i used to have that big paying job and i used to have the cool car and now i you know like now i i'm living a very tough life and i've got this illness and all this stuff like if you can mm. somehow manage to trick yourself into thinking like isn't that something that's hilarious great, great. that's beautiful and, may and maybe um maybe if we want to turn this could i have you um heard of the we'll see poem about the farmer and the boy and his son i don't think so okay yeah i, I really love what you're saying. So as I look this up, the one thing that I'm yearning for, in a way, um, is how do you cultivate that, Katie? There, there seems to be people at certain times and certain points who have been able to really realize that in a complete way. And I think we all, there's, I don't think there's a single person who hasn't realized it for a fixed period of time, a limited period of time. Like I told you when I almost, you know, got really sick and then three weeks later, amazing. And I realized it directly every day without trying. It was just amazing. Um, so it seems like someone got onto this and started to cultivate it, but how do you think we cultivate this? Well, I think I like the, the phrase practice, a practice. I, lo I love that meditation is considered a practice. It's not a hobby and it's not a prayer. It's a practice. And so I feel like if just like looking for the dissatisfaction, I feel like it's so similar to what we've already said, using the dissatisfaction as a, a sign. It's like when people go to sleep and in sleep studies and they say, you want to have a lucid dream? Well, when you see a red light flash like this three times in your sleep, we're going to put these goggles on you. And when you see three flashing lights, it could be a tail light, it could be like a beacon on a hill, it could mm -hmm. be somebody's necklace it kind of shines in light three times. Like when you see three red lights, you control the dream. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, like that's what they do in studies where like, like just pay attention, like as, as you sleep, like hopefully this will be distinctive enough to you. Hmm. Interesting. You know, and, and then the people are like, yeah, I had, was having this terrible dream where I was taking a test in study four and I was naked in public. Then all of a sudden I'm like, I saw a flash of three red lights. I'm like, oh, I'm going to fly. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to, I'm going to fly above the clouds and I'm going to go to a waterfall and I'm going to like, it's like you just write the script. And so I feel like, if you can use, like we were saying, use dissatisfaction, I almost feel like it, dissatisfaction is those red lights. Like, okay, we're in this weird illusion and something's really bothering you. And this is an opportunity, like, look at yourself. Mm. What is going on there? Like, intimacy with yourself. Like, uh, you know, that, right. I almost feel like the same thing happened with the change. Like, shit, like, has this wrinkle always been there? Or right. like, oh, wait, you know, my album is not number one anymore? Or like, whatever right. it is you're measuring life by. Mm -hmm. um, if you can look at that and have it be the flashing lights that signify like this is part of the fun mm. you know why else would we be on earth unless we want to change mm. right I love it this has been very good Katie you're frozen but you ended on a high note so <laughs> So yeah. the way, it's accepting the wave of like, oh, so instead of being devastated, like, mm -hmm. so what opportunity does that unlock for me? Right. Like it's changed and it might be really, really hard and I might be devastated and somebody I love just died. Right. What do I do to fill that void? What do I do with them and, and tribute to their memory? Mm -hmm. Is this an opportunity for me to volunteer for their favorite cause? Is this a... Is this an invitation to help others through their grief? Like, no matter what the thing is, it's an opportunity and it's a time for you to change because the world's changing on you anyway, so you might as well join it. I love right? that, yeah. I really like that. It also reminds me of that 
at times I think I feel this kind of infinite capacity. And, um, um, and I think we all feel this openness from time to time. So I talk about capacity kind of as openness to be there for others and stuff. And part of it is that I think it's that realization of I accept all the change that's going to happen that could be possibly coming my way. I'm not trying to defend my territory. I'm not yeah. trying to defend against change. I'm not spending my time. I mean, you know, and so the space I have is, well, I'm not defending. I'm not spending my whole day defending, making sure I have the right um, set up for every single thing. So I have all of my pleasures in order and I don't have, I don't want to see this person today. I want to see that person today. Is that person? Today? And it, I do want to see people. It's not like, it's like uh, mute, muted for me. It's just that maybe Katie's available today. Maybe she's not. I'll right. see. It's the whole thing about externalizing satisfaction. Like mm -hmm. you can be at peace with where you are. And if you mm -hmm. happen upon another person or experience, that's all the better. Right. But if it doesn't happen, you're not going to be crushed. Or if somebody shows up and they're like, I'm new to IDO and I've, I've been at the Zen center twice as long as Christian and my robe is twice as simple. And like, and like you wouldn't be like, Hey man, that's my role. Like, <laughs> That's like my, my lane. Like you would be right. very, very like, oh, isn't that fascinating? Like, but other people might be threatened. Like, I'm the one, I'm the graphic designer that people want on their project. Right. How dare you? Like, that right. anxiety that comes from the friction of like, mm. everything can change, but like, I know that I'm still the best at, at this. Right. So like, right. I know that my identity is like, you can count on me to be the person in the room who's the most this. Right. And that's, that's again, trying to create some sort of permanence. Like, right. that's who I am. Right. I'm the kooky one that like hosts things. Like, right. oh, someone else is funny and is hosting a thing. Like, right. for me, I'd be like, oh, thank God, I'm tired of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, half of them all do the other half. It'll be great. But like, like if you yeah. be threatened, if your value is externalized like that, right. it's because you want permanence. Your your celebrity was like one of that nest egg that was a massive nest egg because he he thought he wanted to be able to coast forever and never have right. to worry. Right, permanently. Permanence is right. the problem. Like, if right. you just accepted, like, some of the coolest musicians, celebrities ever ended up destitute in the gutter. Right. And actually, their story is pretty awesome when you read Right. And it's absolutely fine. Right. It's right. absolutely. It's like, or they gave up fame and became, like, a school teacher or something. Right. You know, these crazy stories where it's like, most of them say, thank God I got out of that rat race. Like, it's right. an opportunity. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the fear, like, no, I must be permanently rich. Right. Well, I spend 50K a month. <laughs> right. right. So obviously it means I need more permanent right. money. Yeah. The problem isn't with my spending. <laughs> the problem is that people might not like me tomorrow. That's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I can't beautiful. change. They have to always like me. Uh, right. Yeah. So I think it's, it's that external, it's all about mm. internal internal fortitude like mm -hmm. being enough for yourself and i feel like it's an epidemic that's a bigger pandemic people like when i see people socializing during all this i'm like i get it it's nice to hang out but why would i, I why would you want to like there's not one person on this planet where you'd be mm -hmm. like i need to be face right. to face with you with a mask off like i just have no right. desire i'm like i don't even know why that comes up it's because you're externalizing you're you don't exist if someone else isn't seeing you mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. can't take an instagram photo and be like i went to this place for breakfast there was no line because everyone else knows that they might die if they come to the stupid restaurant yeah you know it's bragging yeah. rights and I'm, it's a sign of not self-love it's external right. external I validation. yeah and i think to add to that i think there's a flip side which i, I like where you're going with it. It's also that um, COVID is just showing imp uh, our impermanence. And yeah. I think, um, so there's both. I really like your, where you sat with that, which is, you know, I have, for those people who are like, I have to go out. I cannot give up my sociality. Um, that wanting that old life back, that permanent that oh but when we used to do it we used to go out to the park and be with each other and have a drink and party and now things have changed and i don't want to 
I don't want it to change, right? It's resisting the change rather than, well, what's this new thing I'm working with where I'm looking at everyone on, on Zoom all the time. And it's also the other way. I think it's also that you, you also have to, I mean, another consequence of that, which is a very serious consequence, is that in order to be completely fearless, it's to be completely fearless of change. And that also means your own death. Right. And so um, not about putting people at risk or anything like that, but I think, you know, some of the most fearless people have been where they've, they've literally given up. I mean, they've let go of their fear of death and they could be completely there <clears throat> because they weren't trying to, this biological program wasn't playing out. Is like, well, I think a lot of the most enlightened people are mm -hmm. people who have a terminal diagnosis. It lifts mm, right. so many of the things that mattered yesterday. Like, right. so-and-so got promoted? Mm. I want the promotion. And then you get a diagnosis where it's like, you might have three months. Right. And all of a sudden, you're just like, I don't, that promotion meant nothing. Like, right. um, you know, like, I need to, I just need to be in this moment. I, I can't do my whole bucket list. I'm just going to enjoy the cup of tea that I was mm. just served mm. and I'm going to enjoy feeling as good as I do today. Cause tomorrow I'm probably going to feel a little bit worse every single day. Like those, right. like that kind of thing, like being friends yes. with my friend Morgan. I mean, he was dying and he couldn't have been more delightful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. he was delightful before, but um, like he even got evacuated because the fires a couple years back mm. and he was put in a casino where of course everyone's smoking indoors mm. And he's on oxygen and he's dying of cancer and he has no lung capacity. And he's in this giant like gymnasium filled with God knows who doing God knows what. And of course I'm worried sick cause I'm a worrier. So I'm like, Oh my God, what's going on? And he's like, Oh, it's crazy. I'm having a blast. It is insane. <laughs> I can't believe this happened. <laughs> Like, don't worry, they're gonna love me. I know it. I'm like, no, you can't eat anything. Like, there's no good nutrition in the whole place. Like, I don't have anything that turns into sugar, and I'm really supposed to avoid trans fats. And I'm really, and he's like, he's trying to stay alive. And he's like, mm. the food here's gonna kind of kill me, but I think I kind of sweet talked to one of the volunteers into finding me a chicken breast somewhere. I'm like, what? He's like, it's hilarious. It's crazy. Like, he's got this lens on it where he's like, he always had a good time all the time. Right. But I'm like, I think you have permission mm. to rant and be really, really hostile and like feel like a victim right now. And he's like, are you kidding me? Mm. This is hilarious. Like, it's <laughs> so um, good. You know, so um, I just, I yeah. think there's something, I think he might've already had it. He had a real show to vivre, but I think mm. it's almost freeing to know like your struggle is, go is, is gonna come, like for people who get to know, your struggle's gonna come to an end and it's super, super awful. Right. But you get your priorities straight. Right, I think, yeah. and I think you that's. People you love and you say that you love them and it's not because of anything they just did. It's like, right. you meant to me in my life. Like, Unconditionally. You have those, yeah, you have those moments where you're like, this is what made my life worthwhile. You're knowing you as one of them, like. Right, and, and it, sorry it, I think it's worth saying that it goes, it goes both ways because there's also the opposite that they, they both seem to be confronting the same thing, but there's, we could say, which is not really true. There's two ways to do it. There's an enlightened way. And then there's the complete, you know, painful struggle of not wanting to let go of any of it, which I've been able, I think to see both with my uh, old grandmother, and England, who didn't want to die, but was going to die. And she, she was just absolutely livid. Like she was so angry that this disease had shown up and, and really she didn't have anyone to blame, but a lot of people took, I mean, bless her heart. I think it's, it's this game that is so vicious of, you know, trying to spend your whole life trying to make things permanent. Yeah. Right? Um, he felt entitled to more life. Right. And like, like, that's, that's a hard road when you feel right. entitled to anything. Right. So like, she, you know who I am. Like, I didn't tell you you could come in cancer or whatever. Like, right. Right. I've made up this whole life. I have a, 
I've, I've got a, I worked really hard. I stored up all this money. I have all of this respect from people in my field. I write books. Um, I'm a, I'm a valuable person. I'm, I'm, you know, monumentalizing myself in some way. And you're telling me that something, you know, especially with people who are like myself, I think I would have suffered from lots of it because of the strident independence, right? That, that, um, not strident independence, just that I'm going to will my way, right? I think those people, if they don't wake up to that, they end up, you know, being crushed by the, the fact that the end is near. Um, and some people finally end that independence, that striving. Um, I remember um, one of the Kelly brothers talking about that and, and waking up and like, oh, I, I didn't care about any of the clients. Yeah. Right. David Kelly, he had his cancer and it was like, you know, and I think there is, there is something to be said for people that fight. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of times um, they say the people who survived in the concentration camps, it wasn't just because they happened to be the f most fit. The people whose hearts got broken by it, which mm -hmm. I think would be very easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay, walk another 10 miles in the snow. Cause if you lay down, I'm going to shoot you. I can tell you right away who would have laid right down. Let's see. I can lay down and it's over. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. With a gun, here I go. Mm. Like, like, <laughs> but mm. it's the people who are like, I went to a talk once and it was two survivors. And one of them was like, the only thing that got me through was love. Mm. All I did was think about the people that I love mm. and the love they had given me. And even if I'm the only one that survives, I can give this love in their name to everyone else that I meet. And I can tell their story and do it with love. And love was a passion. Love kept me alive. Every day, I thought, even if I never see anyone I love again, I have the love forever and I'm going to, I'm going to channel that for the rest of my life and I'm going to mm. make it so I can keep loving despite all this. Mm. Mm. And then the next lady got up and she's like, I'd like to counter with the uh, hate got me through. Um, <laughs> I hate so much. I hated those assholes. I'm like, you're not taking my life. You can take everything right. but my life. Like, it's so right. it like these two women that were like at the polar, like passion kept them alive. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's saying like, again, right probably very similar realities right being very different perspectives yeah. on like Confront confronting that yeah totally different yeah. yeah both of them had a fire both of them had a passion and so in some ways i think your grandma is admirable mm -hmm. to be like i'm not going to go quietly but there's right. something yeah. about being like okay so the writing's on the wall i mean i don't think it happens for everybody like to be told that right. there's not a chance. yeah but yeah I, 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 that's totally I right the people I, who get that like, I feel like most of them, there's a relief of being like, I don't have to worry about what I'm doing for my summer holiday next year and if the vacation will be cool. And I don't have right. to worry about paying my taxes again. And I don't have to worry about the minutia of life. I can just focus on the few things that mm. I love and hopefully have a lot of it. And I go to a hospice where they're going to let me have every comfort and just like savor every breath. Like mm. I don't, I know I'm not going to have many of them so that I can finally pay attention. Like right. I think it's freeing to some people. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think part of that is though, I want to slightly turn that is that the survival is not um, a valuable or not valuable. I don't think the fact that they made it is important actually. Um, it, I don't know if that matters that people make it or, or, or not make it through those hard situations. I, I think the confrontation is what I was pointing to more is of just that these sort of things make us confront um, change. I do think that if we're in a concentration cap and, and we don't know if we're going to die, there's this huge uncertainty, right? Um, let me let me mute myself and, and stop my video for a second. I'm okay. putting the kettle on. It's really loud. I'll All keep right. listening. No problem. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that the concentration camp, we have this ability. It's not certain that we're going to die. Um, so um, there may not be any reason to say, okay, I'm just going to give in. Um, and, and in fact, you know, being one with 
the fact that you're in a concentration camp and continuing to live seems like always the best option. I think with the dying part, I was, I was talking more towards, so say that you're given a cancer diagnosis, the change that you're dealing with is, can you be in this moment, let go, you don't have to hold on to um, the fact that you were valuable, you're still immensely valuable every moment is valuable and that moment may be spent fighting cancer going to your doctor and actually getting all sort of prescriptions or whatever and fighting or it could mean like saying i'm not going to do prescription i don't know if either of those there's there's no there's neither one is right or or i mean less right or 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 neither is right or wrong like ahead of time we don't know that and survival is not, I don't think, by de facto value. I think the point uh, being that in confronting that, we can cling on to, I don't want things to change. Uh, but the opposite is not dying, right? It's, it's, it's being with, this is what's happening. I do... It, it does appear that I have really bad cancer. It does appear that my time is limited. And I don't think that that's intellectual. I think it's really direct, right? Um, for a lot of people, it's like literally hits you in the face. You don't, anyone describing it is just, that's not even close to the real thing, right? It's like, I look out and everything has changed. I look out and I think of my client projects and there's no value. I don't feel anything. <laughs> Right. It's not like a, so I, I, I think what we're talking about is more that, that there are things in the world that make you confront the impermanence more than others. Right. And yeah. sometimes we need these. I mean, like you said, some of the more enlightened people, which I would agree with you are people who have had to uh, confront it directly. Um, like people that are dying um, or I guess it also in, in concentration camps where they have to face their own impermanence or their family's impermanence or loved ones impermanence. A tangential story is, I don't know if you know that, um, you know, David Kelly was really good friends with Steve Jobs and right. Steve Jobs got cancer first, mm -hmm. a different kind, but like bad. And he, he had an ego trip where he's like, I don't, I can just use some herbs and the power of my mind. I'm, you know, I'm a brilliant guy. Mm. And there's no way I'm going out. So like, and I'm not mm. going to do it with the traditional crazy chemical. Like he did research and he's like, I don't want chemo. That's, that shit's poison. Mm. So he's like, I can do this. He didn't. Mm. And so when DK got his diagnosis, Steve called him and said, hit it with everything they have. Like he had to come to terms with like his, he probably could have, I mean, who knows uh, with hindsight, but I think he realized like, I'm such a cocky bastard. I had the best doctors in the world. Mm. And I had to say like, my mind's pretty fucking good. I'm going to mm. think myself out of this. Mm. Do it my way because I'm Steve Jobs. You know, like, and he knew it killed him. Like he knew mm. he didn't help himself at all. He mm. just thought mind over matter, you know, like power of positive thought. And right. I'm going to go with some ancient, just an old herbs. Like, you know, it's just so interesting that he calls, like they're a technology firm and he's like, save your technology. I got this. Like, mm. you know, and he had to uh, just think that that's why David mm. Kelly's alive. Cause if Steve had had a positive mm. outcome, he, Steve would have been like, you don't need that garbage. Take this thing. But like DK mm. survived because in part Steve was like, I was so wrong. Don't try anything alternative. Just go, just hit it hard. It's sure going to hurt. It's going to be bad, but I think you can beat it. And so mm. it's just a, kind of a funny, I mean, not funny, but, uh, a bittersweet story between two fr brilliant friends, hmm. uh, you know, where it's easy to get stuck in, in the, I know better, so right. you know who I am. Right. And there's no way I'm going to die because you know how many more things I have cooking up? Like, I got a lot yeah. to do. Yeah, I think so I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. yeah, I think that part is, for me, that's what stands out to me is, is that maybe he thought, like, oh, I've got a, do all this other stuff and i don't know I, I guess maybe you know more about it if he accepted that it's possible that he's not going to do that other stuff or need to do that other stuff and was that a possibility 
of something that was being um, mentally accepted that, well, rather than like, I don't know, I definitely have to build the next iPhone before I go, right? I think that those are, not saying that that's not a good thing, but like, um, yeah, so again, confronting that, I, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, so, this is the little anecdotal, yeah. and it kind of combines the impermanence and change, and like, oh, it can't change, because I'm, I'm super important. Like, I've been down, right. and I'm back up, and I'm blowing people's minds, and I got more to give, and right. I'll do it my way. Like, it's so much ego. Right, um, I see, yeah. Um, but anyway, I feel like there was something else I was gonna add, but I don't remember. There's lots of food for thought here. So um, I, I don't know if you're gonna send another one of your bullet pointy kind of things and I can try to make, I, that's helpful. That's helpful. I, 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 it helped a lot last time because I, I really was trying to, I mean, I had my post-its about certain things that, that came up during our pre-conversation that I mm -hmm. thought you'd want to flag, but also like the bullet points that it just so happened they did correspond pretty well to the bullet points and like, what we'll be covering. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I also want to know, and I'm just going to read this to you as a last thing, um, this we'll see thing. And it says, um, once upon a time, there was an old farmer who had worked his crops for many years. One day his horse ran away. Ran away. Upon hearing the news, his neighbors came to visit. Such bad luck, they said sympathetically. He must be so sad. We'll see. The farmer replied. The, me the next morning, the horse returned, bringing with it two other wild horses. How wonderful, the neighbors exclaimed. Not only did your horse return, but you received two more. What great fortune you have. We'll see, answered the farmer. The following day, his son tried to ride one of the untamed horses, uh, it was thrown and broke his leg. The neighbors again came back to offer their sympathy on his misfortune. Now your son cannot help you with your farming, they said. What terrible luck you have. We'll see, replied the old farmer. The following week, military officials came to the village to conscript young men into the army. Seeing, and seeing that the son's leg was broken, they passed him by. The neighbors congratulated the farmer on how well things had turned out. Such great news, you must be so happy, the man said once again. We'll see. <laughs> and the next day, his son got out of bed with his broken leg and stabbed his father. <laughs> his father said and his nothing last else. Word, his last word was, see? See? <laughs> <laughs> finally got it out of him. <laughs> by the horses. That was his son's whole thing was like, my father only says two words. I'm going to try to see what can make him say something different and apparently it was only stabbing him. That now you see, Dad, you're trying to be touched with the ice cream. Right. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty great. It is it is a lot of chance. Like mm -hmm. it's amazing how many disappointments like can actually be the path to something like I just think about all the times you know the Beatles were rejected or mm. you know stuff like that where it's like if maybe if they had had that contract right away he would have had 145 that went pretty well mm -hmm. got in the top 20 never got another album deal like it, it's just so weird that like I don't know um right. life can be strange it's not necessarily merit-based and it's just a lot of it seems to be luck I don't know it's a whole different subject but um yeah. but yeah I mean Sometimes persistence pays off, and sometimes it's just uh, the ego right. who will not relent. It's hard to know. Yeah, and accepting whatever you, your, the cards are. I mean, still working with it, that doesn't mean not trying things, but just, hmm, this is just, this has just been my cards. I mean, I've been through 40 years of life and maybe made music for like 20 of them, and I never became the Beatles or something, and just, yeah. Just we'll see, and who knows? Someone asked me, "Do you do you think you'll um, ever be a sports player, a sports star?" Uh, now that you're, I, I turned twenty nine, and I was like, "I don't know." Who knows? I don't think so. I think it's really unlikely, 
but I don't think there's anything that's determined, right? So I think that's also because of impermanence, because everything else is changing. So how do I know I won't end up over there? And so that's the beauty of having an impermanent world, that all these structures are not set in stone, that they're yeah. moving, right? I was just telling a single friend of mine that like, I love, I mean, I've been with Casper for 14 years, but I actually really love being single. I don't like the whole like first date over and over again, except I do like the first date because you can ask any question and you get an honest answer. It's the only time. So you say. <laughs> like, what would your ex-girlfriend say about you? And like, well, like, That's a great you question. with a narcissist who doesn't want to get married, who's too loyal to his mother, who can't hold down a job. I'm like, that's interesting, isn't it? And like, you're never going to hear that from that guy ever any other time. <laughs> it's the only time people are honest with you. Um, the first day, because you're like, I don't care. I don't fancy you that much. Whatever. I'll tell you. Um, but I, not, I don't miss that part that much, although the first date's pretty fun, um, just for that reason. Um, but it's fun because you don't know, like there's, the uncertainty can be kind of a thrill. Mm -hmm. And there was a cassette tape that I had, a book on tape back in the day, Dating Myself, by Meryl Marco, who was one of the head writers for David Letterman, who had a late night talk show, and they dated for a long time. She's a very, very funny woman, and she wrote mm. a bunch of books. And one of them was a fake help book, a self-help book called How to Be Hap, Hap, Happy Like Me. She's hilarious. And she also wrote another one called uh, Meryl Marco's Guide to Love, and she posed on the cover with like big hunting dogs and a big rifle, and she was like, in a hunting outfit. Very funny. <laughs> she was an early hero of mine, like funniest mm. lady ever. And she had this whole thing about, she had a chapter called My Blind Date with Destiny. And she's like, when you're single, mm. everywhere you go is a blind date with destiny. Mm. Mm. He might be in here. Like, you might drop your groceries and then you pick up the grocery. Like, you might turn a corner. He's like, just like every day is the blind date with destiny. Mm. Like, you don't get blind dates with destiny like that when you're like mm. hitched up with someone. So like, mm. but I love, I love that being part of the change, like seeing changes. Like I never saw that as like a void. Mm. Like I mm. thought being available for like adventure was like mm -hmm. not an empty, like I don't want to use the word empty, but like it wasn't a right. lack. Right, it right, like, right. It was an invitation to an adventure that if I were with someone, I might not be able to take. Right. So, like, like if people could frame what they like, the possibility of change in that way. I still yes. think a surprise party, blind date with destiny. That's. I love like, it. It really it's like a comedy book, but like the blind date with destiny when he's like, "I'm so tired of these women. They're so weird." They've got so much baggage, and I'm like, can you, can you continue on with your blind date with destiny? He's like, shut up, shut up. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I want to hold that as a title of like, I think, rather you're hitched or not. Um, and this is another story I don't want to get into, but I remember coming into contact with a reified image of my partner and how something opened that up so yeah and we'll talk about it another time but i think that is the again that's the salvation of quality to experience the world as a blind date with destiny that's beautiful yeah it's so cool because you don't know blind date you're not quite sure what somebody looks like i don't think these happen right. anymore like this like went out of vogue in 1965 like most of the things i talk about but like you know, like, you meet me at, I'll be at the cafe, I'll have the flower and light my lapel. Right. You know, like, keep your, I'll be carrying this book under my arm, like, that kind of old school, like, right. answering paper ad, where it's like, okay, you'll know me because I, I have a, my bowler hat has a carnation in it, or, like, that kind of old time, right. like, couldn't, can't send each other pictures, and besides, people don't look like their pictures anyway, who are we kidding? So, um, mm. But, you know, that blind date with Destiny where it's like, you don't even know what it looks like. But if you frame right. it that way, everyone's the match. Yeah. Every yes. opportunity is like, oh, this is the, this is the one they're fixing me up with. This yeah. is the project they're fixing me up with or the hobby or the conversation. Right. You know, it's, it's like you, you've been – it's nice to think that the universe has set you up. Yeah. Like it's not – it takes the pressure off of you. Like, this is what's in your path. Yeah. And it won't be again. Today's a different right. day than yesterday. So, like, enjoy your blind date. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, yeah, and we can never be, I think the, now I'm thinking these, it's a good way to put like the Zen masters, like what I think they all have in common is that they seem to be on a perpetual blind date. And um, yeah, and I'm wondering if that's the practice we have people do actually, is take something that they've totally maybe felt like they've exhausted and because things are empty, you, you know, my partner is empty, all this, I have the ability to totally change, um, to have a fresh experience of that, right? Right, right. So there's, there's like, I think that's a good assignment for exploring what otherwise might seem rote or mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. granted that you're in a routine. But I think we can also use it for, also keep your eyes out for, something falling falling into your lap that you could just let be right. or you let it follow be. a little yeah. further. So like I was in a brainstorm today about how to approach getting more locally owned, smaller minority led businesses into our vendors. I don't really order from vendors, but I'm in this brainstorm and I don't recognize half the people. I don't know who, what they do. And there's this guy, I actually have written down like, the very first thing I have on my post, okay, I, like, what would you do to get people to use vendors? And I'm like, well, you have a Slack bot, right? Uh, you have got a Slack bot that if you type in ISO and you're like, flowers, Slack bot, and then it'll be like, okay, like, and it'll pop up like three different mm. flower, florists in your area that, that are from minority owned people. And, mm. he, and the guy beat me to it and he's like, what if we had a Slack bot? Slack bot? And I was like, Oh my God. And the next idea I had, (laughs) like, what if we had just a place where people can put reviews of things? Like maybe it's a Slack channel and I held up testimonial Slack channel. And I was like, who are you? (laughs) Seven other people. I'm like, who are you, Chris? Who are you? And he's like, oh my God, yes. And we're like, so then the next one is he's like, what if we just had blanks? I don't want a whole bunch of words about, just say I bought blank from blank Mm. because uh, the result was blank. He's like, I don't Mm. need people writing me essays. I just want to know. And I'm like, mad libs. (laughs) And so we started chatting and I'm like, dude, you complete me. Who are you? And he's like, I'm going on vacation next week. We're going to get coffee. We're going to get coffee the week after. Like, what? I'm like, what do you do? He's like, I'm a David. Data scientists are like, what? Like, oh, <laughs> it'd be so easy to be like, oh, it's funny. That guy and I keep having the same ideas. Right. Uh, but, but instead, I was like, dude, talk to me. Like, I, I <laughs> said, we have a phone line where people can call and just say, I just got cookies from the bakery that's owned by these Vietnamese couple, and they're the coolest, and the cookies are great. And, like, you just record. And I'm like, <laughs> I, 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 it's called the hotline. And he's like, in the text, he's like, hot. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had like a flow chart where I'm like, we call it best Vens. Hmm. And it's like a broken heart necklace with the best friends necklace. You know those? And he was just like, yes. And so like, we're going to be friends. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be friends. Like, I don't know who he is. Right. But I was like, we got, we got to hang. Like, I don't know what this, I, like, instead of just being like, oh, it's, he seems to like my jokes. Like, right. I was like, I, huh. I had a blind date with Destiny where I'm like, I can use more of ideal friends. Like, he doesn't Beautiful. have to work at my location. So it's like, it's like taking that blind date energy where you're yes. like, this is an invitation to more than just like, that was funny. I don't know who right. he is and I'll never see him again. I was like, let's be friends. Right. <sighs> it's kind of making me want to switch the topic a little. So I'll write about, yeah. because it, it makes me want to make dating the theme. Because I yeah. think it's, because dating is the most likely person you will reify that will definitely surprise you. <laughs> like, especially people that get surprised in horrible ways, right? What they experience is horrible. They're like, I know you, you are this person. And the person's like, no, I'm not. And they right. feel almost trapped, um, some people, but anyways, yeah. yeah. It's locking someone into their identity. Right. That saying, they don't have. Right. Right. Instead of saying, like, we're going to go on this adventure and we're both going to evolve sometimes together, sometimes in opposite directions, we have to find ways to, to make you into a permanent object. 
like if we're if we're making a permanent so-called permanent whatever that means now but like if we're committing to each other in a very public way and standing it up in front of everyone we know and love and saying we intend to ride this thing forever mm -hmm. um the rules really should be like i mean they right. say in sickness and, and health and they don't say like in your current state <laughs> in your future state like they're trying to say that in the vows of like for better or for worse like right. they should be like more enlightened, less enlightened. <laughs> right, right, right. Like more right. materialistic, right, less right. materialistic. The things right. that like really, really come into play where you're like, but I thought yeah. you cared about status symbols. And so that's what I married you because you right. all have all Gucci duffel bags. Right. You're telling me I can't buy Gucci duffel right. bags. You're going to tell me to change because you're feeling like you're not who I married. <laughs> <laughs> like the moment I, I, I moved out of the celebrities with how. Hall Han, um, and I was like, we moved to an apartment, and I, we didn't really talk about it. And I was like, I really can't pay this rent. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't know my financial situation at the time. I was like, yeah. So about that permanent seeming celebrity me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that that took some working out. You so. ripped that band-aid right off. You're like, oh, did you not know? I have no money. I uh, forgot zero to bank account. What's I, I I don't have one of those. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. To, but you, I think relationships are a great place for reification, for permanence, and for our ability to deal with impermanence. A lot of people go out on like you know, five year dates or get remarried. They're trying to do things to go, things are fresh because my mind keeps making you into a box, you know? And I and I can't help but operate on you like this. So let's go here, or let's do this, let's do something to get my mind out of this thing, right? Yeah. Right. Um yeah. So anyways I think it's beautiful. And I want maybe I can even question you about your relationship. Ooh, Ooh, getting personal. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's great because, um, I, I mean, the reason why we work is because we're like two little kids that are just masquerading as grown-ups. <laughs> so when people are like, when are you two getting hitched? I'm like, have you met us? Right. That's great. Like, those questions become, I was just talking to an experienced team, too, where I'm like, hey, you younger girls, like, at some point, your family will stop saying, when you're going to have a baby? And what they mean, what they, what's really happening is that you're just old, but it's so much better when they give it the fuck up. It's like, give it up. Give it, what does it matter? Why do you want me to have a baby? What does it matter? Are you going to get married? What do you think? I'm interested in that. What? Ooh, Katie, so to interesting. I should have expected everything is a question mark. Yeah. Why would you think, like, I mean, I think when it's like age is just a number, like, I seriously forget how old I am. Like, I'm like, <laughs> wait, do the math. And then when it became the aughts, that's really unfair. I'm so jealous of people who are like, well, I was born in 1930. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, and I lived a good. 65 years so it was like you never had to do the math where you're like let me do the math before the zero and then after the zero and add those two sometimes i do it and i'm like that can't be right I don't that's feel awesome it. that's I really awesome feel it. i love so, it uh, yeah i just kind of forget i'm not even trying and i'm like some people i mean i don't yeah. really like say it because it's like yeah. it's a bit alarming <laughs> yeah but it sounds like you may not be attached to it or, or, or i don't think so it. Also, I think I had a, f a former life, Christian, because I remember in kindergarten, distinctly, somebody asked me how old I was, and I said 42. And she said, you can't be 42, you're in kindergarten. I'm like, yeah, but on the inside. I think I used to say something like that, Katie, actually, when I was young, too. Interesting. I, I, just, I just was like, yeah, but I'm not, not the bullshit current, like, somebody get me some graham crackers me i mean the real me you know how we're not this is kind of surf like i was like i was trying i was trying to be like you mean you're not 42 on the inside what kind of life are you <laughs>